Father, we're so grateful that you've called us here together. And we just pray now, Father, that you open up our ears that we might hear spiritually, open up our eyes that we might see spiritually. But more importantly, Father, open up our hearts that we might apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, it's such a joy to be in this series. Uh, and this series is entitled Transformed Identity. And now let me just explain what that means. That means that once we grab hold of the fact that we begin to see ourselves the way God sees us, it's going to blow our minds. It's going to change our lives. It's going to establish our self-esteem. It's going to really begin to uh, reposition how we see ourselves. We need to begin to see, you know, that we are somebody. And I know so many Christ followers that go through life and they really don't believe that, they're, that they matter to God. They really don't believe that they're important to God and that they're of value to God. And so what this series has been is just another way of saying, God, you know what? We've had this distorted view of who we are, but by your grace, God, we're somebody. And you know, just week after week, I've tried to introduce you to verses that has focused on the fact that we are somebody. That's why when I went in in week number one, I talked about how we were homemade and handmade and homegrown, that, 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 that we were woven together in our mother's womb, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that all the days were ordained for us before one of them came to be. I wanted us to focus that because I, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your condition or position is in life, that you are somebody because you've been made by the hands of God. And then I tried to take it a step farther. I wanted us to understand that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we are a new creation and that God, the old is gone, that because Christ, because in Christ we are new, all of the old stuff that we did, all of the old habits and all of the old hurts and hangouts, they're gone, that we should walk with a sense of confidence because in Christ we are new. And then in week number three, I talked about, man, we've been promoted because now we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You see, one of the great things about it, about this whole position of being co-heirs with Christ is that Christ doesn't come down to our level. He expects us to be co-heirs with him and he expects us to step up to his level. That he wants us to reach a potential that, that we've never dreamed of because we are co-heirs with him. And then last week I talked about we are saints. And you know, I had so much fun, and it was great to get some of your emails uh, during the week because you never heard that before, because most of us have the concept, I am a sinner saved by grace, and that's a lie. The Word never calls us a sinner. Nowhere in the Bible, you can't find it, where, where anyone in the Bible refers to a Christ follower as a sinner saved by grace. No, we are saints who sometimes sin. We are set apart unto God, and we are holy. And so therefore, instead of being a sinner, we are a saint. That's who we are. And so this morning, you know, I want to go, and I, I, as I looked at the text this morning, I said, how can we take a look at, uh, since we are somebody, how can we get a person in the Bible that I can use as a model of how God repositions us as Christ followers? How is it that Christ can take us who had drifted away from him, but now that we now believe and trust in Jesus, he makes us somebody. Well, I found a story. And now this story is a great story. It is found in the book of Acts chapter 3. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And I'm going to read it. But this is one of these great stories of the Bible. And I believe all the stories in the Bible are great. But in every week I might say this, but this is just a fun story to talk about. Let me read this for you. Again, it is in Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. And this is how it reads. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When uh, he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, taking him by the right hand, 
he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You know, one of the great things about this man and one of the things that's impressed, now most of you all know that I'm a visual learner, that I always have to see a picture. And if I don't see a picture, then it's harder for me to understand. Even when I was school at school, I would always try to visualize what was going on. And so let me see if we can visualize this. First of all, what the text suggests is that this man was crippled. That this man, from the day he was born, he found him, he was crippled. That something inside of the mother's womb occurred, and when he came out, he did not have the ability to walk anymore. And so thus, this guy, can you imagine being crippled all your life? Now, 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 now what's challenging is, is that, you know, it's one thing because in year one, you are totally dependent upon your parents. But this crippled man, his parents carried him all throughout year one, but also in year two. And in year two, most people, they finally learn that it's time to walk. He was in year three, his parents were still lugging him around, and year eight, they were still picking him up and carrying him. Year 10 and year 20, can you imagine that he's still being carried around 20 years later? He cannot walk because he was born crippled from birth. And so we even find that this man, every day as he grew up and into an adult, that they would literally carry this man. He had some friends. He, he knew relationships. And so he'd have his friends carry him, and they would carry him to this gate called Beautiful. And they would sit him down at the gate. Now this man, understand it, this man as he sat there every day, he had an unusual occupation. I don't know if many of you have, would ever apply for it, but his occupation was a beggar. Every day he spent from eight to five begging for money. Now, can you imagine what happens? A crippled man who couldn't walk, and, and probably because he could not walk, he couldn't get to the shower uh, the way he wanted to, so he probably had some type of odor. His clothes were not as clean, but he was right here, this ugly scene right in the gate called Beautiful. He's sitting there. He's just sitting there. People would walk by all day long, going in to pray and spend time in the temple while this site is here. He is, he's begging as they go by, and, and, and he's asking for things, but, 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 but here it is, he's sitting there. Now here's the problem is, is that, is that he really had a distorted view of even the people, not only of himself, but even the people, because he would have, always have to look up to the people. He always had to look up and see them, and, 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 and you know how we are. Can you imagine some of the things we thought as we walked by this homeless man? I mean, no, 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 no. Can you imagine? You know, uh, can you imagine what we, what we thought? Look at this girl. Old bum. Blocking my way from going to church. Sitting right in the middle of the temple gate. How dare him? Stinks. He smells. He nasty. Trifling. But every day he would be there begging. You see, that was a time that even Jesus probably passed him, but Jesus didn't even heal him. He's still there at this gate called Beautiful. You see, the reality is, is that this man was crippled physically. But I want to suggest to you this morning that we are probably very much like this man. You see, we're not crippled physically. We are crippled emotionally and mentally and psychological because the same people that talked about, about the man and, 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 they, and they devalued the man as they walked by, some of the same type of people have devalued us. See, they've said, have you ever been called stupid and dumb and crazy and, and, and I know you won't make it and you don't, you're not one of us and, and how dare you? Have you had people look down on you? In life. That's what people do when they look down upon you. One of the things they do is they devalue you. You see, he couldn't get up. He couldn't look them in the eyes. He just looked at their knees because he's been constantly devalued all of his life. And, 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 and here's the tragedy. Even as, 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 as he's being devalued, you, you know, something about being, being devalued because you learn different habits. For example, one of the habits you learn is that you don't even look at people anymore. 
they walk by and you turn your head and you look away. You don't want to look in their eyes. You, you just drop your head. Can, can I have something? And, and you turn your eyes away. And that's why I think the text suggests that when Peter, when they paused, Peter said, look at me. And he, he had to look up now. He had to reposture and reposition himself to see someone has now asked me to give them my attention. Someone tell when Peter, he had to reposture himself. The man had to give him value. And so this morning, I'm telling you, this morning is going to be good for you. You know why? Because I think what the text is suggesting is I don't care how far people have pushed you down in life. God can pick you up. <laughs> I don't care how much people have said about you. Only the king of kings can pick you up. I don't care. Listen, and don't you look at us like we're so super spiritual because some of the very people that will push us down are in the church. Up! Oh! <laughs> That's the truth. You know, I sometimes, sometimes just breaks my heart when I think about it, but sometimes I think crazy things like, you know, the, the very people that, 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 that we look down upon ran to Jesus and Jesus embraced them. You know, like prostitutes and women in adultery and Samaritan woman and, and women, women with issues of blood and all of these broken people, Jesus said, come unto me. Oh, ah. And so as we look at the text, we see this man who, who is broken physically, but like many of us who are broken mentally and psychologically. And so that's why I came because I wanted to tell, wanted to tell us because this man needed a supernatural encounter with God. This man was, he was a great candidate for a supernatural, a supernatural move of God to change the direction of his life. And that's what you're going to see that happened to this man. That, uh, you know what I call this? I call the, the umbrella of this sermon here, lessons on how to live. The supernatural life. Isn't that right? Right, 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 right. Now, now, now let, me, let me define supernatural. In other words, many of us, we really have been devalued and we really don't expect much from God because we've been devalued. And so most of us go through life just naturally. But once you put your trust and confidence in Jesus, he will put a super in front of your natural and turn your life around. Yes, he will. He, that's what he does. He'll, he'll come in and through his power and through his grace, he'll pick your head up and he'll cause your chest to stick out and suddenly you become the new creation that the word talks about. That's the truth, isn't it? And so we see this. And so, and so see, Jesus wants to take us, instead of us going through this limitless life, Jesus wants us to go and move up to a life that, is, that, that God can take to a level that we've never seen before. And that's why, you know, if I had to give you a couple of principles today, and I'm not going to keep you long, but listen to the principles I would give you. The first, very first principle, if I had to give you principles, it, I would say to live a supernatural life, we must expand and enlarge our expectations from God. Ah, listen, 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 listen. If we're going to live a supernatural life, led, directed, and guided by the Holy Spirit, we must expand our perspective of who God is. You see, the problem with the man, he just didn't expect nothing. He didn't expect anything from God, nor did he expect anything from himself. And we're kind of, no, 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 listen, we're kind of like that sometimes, aren't we? We come in and we don't expect a lot from God. I mean, we, we expect the old mundane little bitty things from God, but not the big things from God. Oh, Lord, bless my food to the nation of my body. So we expect God to go in and clean the food of pesticides. That's about it. No, 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 that's one of the little things. If we get a cut on our arm, we we'll say, oh, God just blessed the arm, and we go in and put some alcohol, and, and we stick a Band-Aid on it. We expect God to do that. But we really don't expect God to do a miracle and heal cancer, do we? We really don't expect God to show up and bless us financially that will eliminate all of our debt. We don't expect that kind of stuff, do we? That's kind of, that's kind of out there. We, don't, we just don't expect God to go in and reposition us to purchase and buy our own business. That's kind of broad for us. We don't expect God to, 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 to provide for college and a university for our children. We don't expect those kinds of things. We just expect a little bit of things. And so God just become a little gimmick that we come in on Sunday mornings. Hallelujah. Bless his name but we never really expect God 
to show up and show out. We don't even expect much from ourselves sometimes, do we? We've been called dumb, stupid, crazy for so long, we just don't even expect anything. Like this old crippled beggar, a lot of, that's what I'm telling you, we're just like this old crippled beggar. Oh no, I'm not gonna go to college. I don't have to, you know, it's just no one else expects it of me, then why should I have to go? Oh no, I'm not gonna give up these food stamps. Everybody expect me to be on them. I'm just gonna keep them. Easier not to work, you know, that's just, so why in the world, I mean, I can get it from somebody else. I can expect stuff from other people and I don't have to produce nothing, therefore I don't have any expectations placed on me. And I wanna tell you, listen, God is a God who loves you, who created you in your mother's womb, who cares about you, and don't you know that if you have a God who loves you, he will provide for your needs, he will bless your socks out, he's not gonna withhold any good thing from you? That God is a good God, and he desires to bless us, and he desires to provide for us, and he desires to be there for us, even when we go through challenging times of our lives. God expects us, but the issue is not what God feels. The issue is we don't expect much from God. And I'm going to tell you, it's hard because when you don't expect nothing from God, you become a loser in life. You gain a victim's mentality. Oh, God, I just need somebody else to help me. So you go out and beg all your life. And that's what he was doing. He was begging. Oh, if I, maybe I can get some wealth. No, maybe I can. No, you don't have to do that. You just need to expect more from your God. You see, I believe that we sometimes live in environments with low expectations. I remember, I remember, I won't ever forget this. I remember my first year in the NFL. Can I tell you what happened? Let me tell you, it was the worst year I had ever had. I mean, it was a horrible year. All of my life, I was used to winning. Oh no, when I went to high school, man, we whipped some guys so bad. I mean, they had to take us off the field at halftime and cancel a game because they knew we'd try to run it up to 100 points in a football game. In college, three of the four years we were in the top five in the nation. And my first year in the Cleveland Browns, man, we got out there. Game one, we lost. Game two, we lost. Game three and four and five, we lost. And I'm flying home on this airplane saying, Lord, what in the world have you done to me? Game six, we lost. And then game seven, we lost. And game number eight, we just barely won. And they fired the whole coach. They, they fired the coach. And then the next eight games, we won four out of eight. Ended up five and 11. And I won't ever, I won't ever forget walking, walking back into the coach's office and he said, Ricky Bolden, when you come back, a guy named Marty Schottenheimer, German, he said, it's gonna be a different environment when you get back. Don't you come back expecting the same thing you're leaving here with. So I won't ever forget, went home for three months. I came back and I, I walked into the locker room and he had this huge picture of a Super Bowl trophy, right as you walked in the door. And I'm like, what in the world? He must, he, he must have forgot we were five and 11, you know? And I saw this picture of the Super Bowl. So I, I walked in the door, I'm like, wow, that's pretty neat. And so then I went down to the trainer, and guess what he had in the trainer's room? He had a big old, he had this big old picture of a Super Bowl trophy. And I'm like, what in the world? There's another Super Bowl trophy picture, you know? Then I would go in the shower and I'd be washing up, and guess what he'd have? A big old Super Bowl trophy. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> Marty's been smoking some crack, you know? What's going on with Marty? <laughs> this is our head coach. And so, and so I'm just checking my, I'm like, what is it? So Marty sits down and he looks up and he said, guys, I don't know about you. He said, but I don't know who, if, you got, if you've gotten used to losing, you need to get up and leave this place right now. If you've, got to, if you've gotten used to just simply going out and giving up in the fourth quarter, you need to leave because the game has changed today. He said, you see these Super Bowl trophies, that's where we're going. He said, from now on, we're gonna be in that Super Bowl every year. Do you understand that? And we were looking like, what in the world? And you know, all of a sudden, we'd be lifting weights and Marty, we'd go in and we'd see this big picture of a Super Bowl trophy and all of a sudden we began to lift differently. It changed the way we differ. You know why? Because our expectations changed. 
That's what happened. Then we go in and we take a shower and we talk about the trophy. Man, wouldn't it be nice to start holding the trophy, man? Wouldn't it be nice just to, just to walk up and, and imagine who you give credit to? And, and so then, and then we go in and we walk in the building talking about the trophy. He changed our expectations. That's what he did. Next year, we were in the AFC Championship game, one game from the Super Bowl. We did that three years in a row. The worst season we had was 11-5 and five because he changed our expectations. And I want to tell you that if you want to change your life, you better change your expectations. If you don't expect your marriage to win, guess what's going to happen? It's going to fail because you don't expect it to win. You don't expect God to show up and to bring healing. If you walk around talking about being broke all the time, guess what you're going to be? You're going to be broke. Why? Because you don't expect nothing but being broke. The first thing that we need to reprogram is our minds and say, God, we must expect more of a huge God. If you spoke in the entire universe, came into, those, into existence, then why in the world can't you speak and bless my life like never before? I've got to expect more. And if you look at the crippled beggar, didn't expect anything. Had this old welfare mentality, and I'm sure by now you've realized after coming around here for seven years especially, that I'm not a big advocate of welfare because you know why? Because I think what welfare is, it keeps people's expectations low. I don't believe in that. I believe that everyone that has been born in the image of God can raise their expectations, they can have a job, they can buy them a home, they can send their children to college, that God can bless their socks off like never before. Yes, 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 high expectations. And if you want to change your life, change your expectations. See, I, listen, there are certain things I just expect. You know, I'm, I'm very proud daddy. But one thing I raise my children is expecting the best and expecting the most. And you know what? Proof is in the pudding. You go look at my family. I'm the only one that graduated out of nine children. I'm the only one that graduated. But you see, graduation from college was not an option for my children. So my oldest son, Brandon, He's a school teacher. He graduated. I look at my son, Joshua and Caleb. They're both seniors at Columbus State. Leah's at Barrett College, and Mike is on his way. See, I expect them to do it. And when I raise the expectations, guess what? Children walk, they step up to it. And so, again, if you want to change your families, change your expectations. If you want to change your life, change your expectations. What the crippled beggar got caught up in is that he had no expectations of God, and he had no expectations of himself, and the only expectations he had was for other people to give him a handout. That didn't work. And so, therefore, the second principle is this. I said this also. To live a supernatural life means our request must align with God's desires for our lives. Did you get that? Now, 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 now you saw the request, right? I mean, I mean, I don't have to read that over to you. Well, I do it just for the sake of doing it. Listen to what it says here. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those given, going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. You see his request? He asked them for money. Did you, I, mean, you, I mean, you see this, don't you? He asked for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting, expecting to get something from them or expecting to get money from them. Then Peter said, here it comes. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk up! Ah, isn't that pretty? Isn't that pretty? He said, yeah, 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 I know you want to hit the lottery. <laughs> Amen. Come on, lottery. Don't look like you don't play the lottery. You all act like I, but come on now. Listen, listen, I'll come up in stores sometimes behind you, and you up there, I want to hit five, five, five. You get... <laughs> come on, somebody, you lot of winners. We all want to hit the jackpot and hit it fast. We play slot machines, and we want to make it quick, right? But how many of you know that hitting a lot of money can give you everything you want, but it can give you nothing you need? See, that's what this crippled, amen, that's the truth. This crippled beggar didn't understand that. 
He came in and because he had this victim mentality, he wanted, he wanted money, oh, just give me silver and gold. But what he didn't realize is that money will have only perpetuated his condition and his situation. If they would have given this man some money, what in the world would it have done for him? He probably could have taken his money and gone down and sat down in a two-star hotel and got a good night's sleep. He could have gotten his money and he could have gone and bought him a nice uh, a T-bone steak. He could have taken the money they'd given him and even bought a fresh set of clothes. He could have bought him everything that he wanted. But what he couldn't buy were new legs that were going to empower him to walk. Oh, no, 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 money can't buy that. In other words, you know what I'm trying to tell you, don't you? Money can buy you everything you want, but it can't buy you anything that you need. Money can buy you a Celia Postopedic mattress, but money can't buy you sleep. Money can buy you a T-bone steak, but money can't buy you an appetite. Money can buy you a ticket around the world, but it can't buy you a ticket to heaven. Money could buy this man a bed, but it could not buy him the power to walk. Listen, see, money can buy us everything we want, but it never will buy. See, if this man would have, if this man would have simply settled for the money, and Peter and James, they could have gotten rid of him quickly. They would have just given him the money. He would have left and walked away, but he still would have been shortchanged because he still couldn't walk. And so that's why they said, we may not have money, but we've got something else. We've got some power from God that wants power from God connect with your body and your heart, then God's power is more valuable than anything you'll ever desire. That's why you don't ever count anybody out. You know, you, that, that, that's the truth. That's why you never count anybody out. See, we live in a day where people are always counted out. But I, one of the beautiful things about Jesus is that he counted everybody in, didn't he? Oh, no, no, no. You remember the woman, you know, who was getting ready to get stoned for adultery? And Jesus said, no, 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 don't count her out. He counted her in. That's right. You remember the Samaritan woman? Everybody counted her out. Jesus counted her in. You remember Legion who had all the demons? Everybody counted him out. Jesus counted him in. No, no, no. Don't you ever count anybody out because it's not up to you who's counted out. It's up to God who's counted in. Ah. This man, he asked for money. Let me help him get off this so I can get out of here. He asked for money. Now, now, now listen, I'm not going to talk about money. But, you know, some of you, some of our lottery players, come on now. Say amen, lottery players. You on the, come on. Just go on and confess. After church, we'll have a confession. For, uh, now, if you did get the money, you'd probably blow it because you've never been in a situation to manage a million dollars. I mean, just think about if you had a million dollars. I mean, just think about what you'd probably buy. I can see some of you paying off some of your debt. I can see some of you going out, buying a big old house, paying cash for it. I can see you supersizing your hoopty with some 24-inch rims and shine. I can see it all. And you don't even think about, I got to pay the water bill. <laughs> no, that's the truth. You don't even think about, Lord, I got to pay the light bill. And so you don't spend all this money and in three months, the debt comes out. Listen, the light company is going to turn out your light, so you're living in a mansion, broke as the Ten Commandments. <laughs> bad preacher, bad preacher. And so that's why they did not give this man. They didn't give him the money. They didn't give it to him. They gave him something better. They gave him the power of God that empowered him to walk. And then if I had to give you one other thing as I take my seat, listen to this last thing I tell you. I said, not only did he have to expand his expectations, not only did he have to align his desires with God's desires, but I would also say to live a supernatural life means to experience God from a new and fresh perspective. Now, here's the key. Most of our faith is old and dull. Most of us are not excited about Jesus. It's just old, dull faith. You know what I mean? My mama went to church, so I'm going to go to church. Old, dull faith. It's not fresh and alive. You know why most of the time it's because we have never seen people being touched by the power of God. That's right. We've never seen God's presence show up in your life. And if God's presence hadn't shown up in your life, I know where you're going to extend it to someone else's. And so we just simply fall back into this old, stale faith. And the greatest thing we can do is to experience our faith from a new and fresh perspective. Let me give you an example. 
you know, I, you know, I can really appreciate this, this, this poor crippled beggar. Summoned to life. Now, now, just imagine the perspective he's sitting in. Every day, people walk by. He's got to look at knees. It's because he's crippled. You know, he's on the ground. He'd have a mat. So he's watching knees. He could tell, you know, he could tell if it's a male or a female by what they wear. That's so because he's looking at the knees. Every day going back and forth. And then, and then, you know, he was also, as I said earlier, a little, you know, he, he had a lot of guilt and shame. So he wouldn't look up to people, so he was always looking down. You see what I mean? So, so not only is he looking at knees, he's also looking down in life. And, uh, and so day after day, let's say 20 or even 25 or 30 years, he's looking down and, he, and he's looking at knees. And then all of a sudden, watch this, all of a sudden, you know, he get two people, no one's ever asked him this before. They came by and he'd have his cup and they'd drop money and he'd turn his head. They'd drop money and, and, and they'd be distracted, but no one ever, look at me. And he looked up at Peter and John. And Peter said, walk. No one's ever said that to him. Can you imagine that? But, but, but I tell you what even is more of the miracle. As I process it, if you don't use something, you're going to lose it. No, that's the truth. No, no, no. Just think about a house. If you don't live in a house for five years, it's just going to go down. He hadn't used his ankles and his legs for years. I mean, they're just kind of flopping. You know what I mean? Wherever they go, he drag, hit, hit, the, hit brick, and you won't even feel it. You know, they just go numb. Peter looks at him and says, you know, I don't want to just give you money. I want to give you a new and fresh perspective in life. And I don't know, the Bible says immediately there, were, there was filling in his ankles. Wait a minute. I've never felt that before. His legs, you know, they, they hadn't moved. He, what in the world is going Home with me. Now that's what the word says. Something happens in there. And then and then listen, it says, Peter, he, he reached out his right hand. And and, and Peter and, and Peter said, wait a minute, don't just start moving your feet. Let me get you up on your feet. And and Peter pulled him. Ah, I wish I had time to preach another sermon. You know that entitled it? I don't need a hand out. Give me a hand up. Up! <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, sometimes people don't need a hand out. They need somebody to grab their hands and pull them up. Some of you have family members that have been down, and you need to go back and pull them up. Some of you have neighbors and coworkers that are down. They need, but that's not my sermon. I'm talking about a new and fresh perspective, and Peter helped him up. You know, he's no longer looking at knees. He's no longer standing with his head turned. No, 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 no. He doesn't have to look from that perspective anymore. He no longer has to look up anymore at people. He can now look at people. He can now stand up. There's some dignity restored. There is some pride restored. He's looking in their eyes and he's shaking them. But the word says that not only did he, did he stand up, but he starts walking. Can you imagine your legs? They've not moved since you were born. And suddenly there's something that happened. You know, I used to like my Aunt Bessie when she said, give me the activity of my limbs. You know, she went to old school, you know. And she talked there about, there was something happened with the activity of his limbs. That the word says that he stood up, but then he started walking. But it doesn't stop there. Then the word says he started jumping and praising God. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. He started jumping and there was something about God. God brought healing to his body. That's right. And because he healed him, he brought a brand new perspective. And you know, here's, here's the key. Maybe what you, maybe, maybe you say, Rick, I'm okay physically. But what I want to suggest this morning is that maybe you're not okay psychologically. Maybe you're still crippled. Maybe you're still holding on a, a, a love that walked away from you years ago and you can't let go. Maybe you're still crippled and it may be cancer in your body that's slowing you down. You may be financially crippled and what God is saying is, I want to make you whole. I'm not here just to give you a hand out because a hand out means that in a few weeks later you'll be back in your same condition. It's time for you to have a hand up so that I can bring healing to your situation. You've lost hope in your job situation. I'd like to suggest to you 
You just let God show up in a wonderful way. That God can provide it anyway. Yeah, I don't care what they say the unemployment rate is. God can go in the midst of an unemployment rate and God can work out a job that has been opened up yesterday and it's got your name on it and no one else can have it but you. But you see, the principle is, the principle is this. We've got to begin to expect more from God. That's what we have to do. I mean, not, not just this large prayer stuff. God wants you to expect more from him. He wants to heal your family. He wants to heal your life. He wants to reconcile relationships. Expect more from God. But not only expect more, make sure your desires align with his. Because what you want is not really important. God's going to give you what you need, not what you want. Do you hear what I'm saying? And when God provides for you, he'll change your perspective in life. Let me pray for us. Father, what a joy to be here this morning. And Father, I know that there are people here this morning, Father, with low expectations. Father, there are people here who are in desperate need of a miracle in their lives, but they don't expect you to do it. They're going to leave it to chance. They're going to leave it up to good luck, but I pray, Father, they will leave it up to a good God who is able to provide for them. Father, we're here this morning. We're begging you to, to, to show yourself afresh to us this morning. Father, to give us a new hope this morning, to give us a new future this morning. Father, we ask you to bless us like never before. Father, we pray that we understand that we are your children and you love us and care for us. And because we're your children, Father, you desire to provide for us. You desire to bless us. You desire to overwhelm us with all that you have because not only are we heirs of yours, we're co-heirs with Christ. And all of the blessings available to Jesus is, a is available to us this morning. So we, Father, want to posture ourselves to receive from you like never before. Father, we want to receive of, of your peace. We want to receive of your kindness. We want to receive a fresh joy. We want to receive a fresh love. We want to receive from a whole different perspective. Change our perspective, Father, that we might rejoice because we know that when we rejoice, it's going to impact people like never before. We know that people will be amazed by what you do. To you be glory. To you be honor. To you be praise in Jesus' name. Amen.